For last, last, last talk of our session, of our track, uh, Wolf of Power is going to talk about liberating education, which is a very large topic, I can say. And thank you for coming. And at F3, there's a fire tornado show. Actually, <laughs> I uh, it's, it's a very nice one. If you will see him, uh, I will comment that. And let's give a round of applause for her. everyone for being here, especially on a Sunday afternoon and I'm tired out on the third day of the conference. Uh, um, there, was, there was a small mishap actually with this, um, with this lecture. Huh? For whatever reason, the abstract did not get put up in the program. Yeah? So if you look up the program, you see my entire biography, which I thought was the not so interesting part. Um, now the thing is, I, I was actually hoping to get some teachers in here. Are there any teachers active? Uh, but you're probably an enlightened teacher already, right? So, so I'm probably preaching to the choir here, yeah, so. Um, so I'm probably going to tell you things that you already all know, and so it's not really new. Um, you can also guess it's not really new, because if you, if you look at my hair, you can estimate I'm already a bit older uh, than the average um, participant here of the conference. So my, my views may be a bit old-fashioned, but, well, let's see. Okay, I'm with the Science Center. Huh? I like to put this disclaimer, um, you know, Science Center is a government organization. Yeah? My boss may not necessarily agree with what I say. <laughs> and I'm sure our IT people definitely don't agree with what, what I say here. Um, but yeah, never mind. Um, in Science Center, I, I work in a teaching a research lab called uh, Cradle. And um, if you're familiar with the local education system, it's very much uh, focused on road learning, textbook learning. What we do is provide um, science experiments, help on experimentation. We do with, um, research projects with students, basically to, make, uh, to give them an opportunity to see what all these uh, concepts, act concepts actually mean. Uh, so it's not just for, for the exam, but actually to apply things. Uh, in, in my experience, there's a big gap, basically. We, we have students who can recite all the formulas, we give them a simple problem that cries at the application of these formulas, and they don't see the connection. Uh, that's basically what we, we try to, um, the, the gap that we're trying to fill. Um, in the process, uh, we, we design a lot of our own experiments that we do in our workshops. Um, we do a lot of prototypes in our result projects uh, with the students. Um, and it's an excellent way actually to understand meaning uh, because you, uh, Richard Feynman once said um, what I, or I think it was found on the, uh, in, the, in this death room on, on, the, uh, on a blackboard written, um, what I cannot reproduce, I do not understand. Uh, the thing is, if we, the best way to learn something is we build something that uses it. Because then, then you know or you can make sure that you really understand it or you see whether you have misconceptions. For the same reason, then we also like to use our uh, home um, design, home built um, equipment in science experiments. We don't want to, to uh, buy the usual uh, commercial sets simply because if the home built, we have complete control, we know how everything works, and the students and teachers alike can see that things can be home built and can actually work. Yeah? So basically, it's about removing the mental block uh, that things are beyond um, the ability of, of normal people. And of course, we use computers for our R&D, which is what this talk is about. Okay, and some personal observations. Huh? And I'm possibly the oldest person here in the room, yeah? quite likely. Um, so I, I went to, sorry. Okay, I have to stay in the picture, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Never mind, for my belly, you need a wide angle anyway. Um, so, so I was in high school in the 1980s. Yeah? Uh, this were the, these were the early days of home computers. Yeah? So we had 8-bit compu computers. Yeah? One of my first computers was a single ZX 81 Anyone still remembers that one? One kilobyte RAM was not enough to fill the screen. Yeah? Um, but it came with a manual yeah, that, that basically uh, taught you things. Yeah? In those days, we had mainstream magazines um, that discussed algorithms, uh, uh, computer science, um, uh, the electronics behind it, and so on and so on, uh, programming languages. Yeah? In math class, fifth or sixth grade, I'm not quite sure, but I, I, it has to be one of those because I remember the teacher. We learned Euclid's algorithm. We learned uh, 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 prime number thief, uh, classic algorithms. Uh, the same math teacher brought in uh, his uh, computer to show us all, how all this translates actually in doing math. So he, he had written a, a program to um, demonstrate uh, how, to, how to the arithmetic of fractions. Uh, um, so it kind of makes sense. 
And um, my physics textbook actually had basic program code to do scientific simulations in there and explained how it worked. So these were the 80s. Eh? And nowadays, um, I mentor students here in, in our, our teaching and research lab. And they come in, and they come in with a fancy uh, MacBook or whatever. Eh? So 64-bit notebooks with a few gigabytes of RAM. And all they can do is a bit of Word. Not text processing, but Word. PowerPoint. Eh? And, and they're really good at PowerPoint. Eh? They don't have these boring uh, text slides that I have. Eh? Um, they can enter number. Into numbers into Excel. Sometimes they can enter formulas and uh, do a ugly graph. graph but um, okay, and they're very good at consuming. Yeah? And uh, when sometimes uh, schools send their students to attachments for us, they, they, they write. In, 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 uh, yeah, don't expect any any programming or computer skills or whatever from them. Yeah? So and, and I, I wonder why. Yeah? And actually, if, if you look, um, how have actually computers changed? Yeah? Again, back then, yeah, very limited resources. Yeah? And the limited resources mean the software was limited everything. Yeah? Um, lim yeah, it was very difficult to do serious stuff, but actually people aspired to do that. Yeah? People uh, in the 1980s started to look at how, how can we program computers to, to simulate things, how can we uh, use computers to design circuit boards, whatever. And it was a fight because the computers didn't have enough memory for a lot of these things. Yeah? And today it's the opposite situation. We have workstation class computers. Not even our hand uh, handphones are more powerful than uh, supercomputers of, of 30 years ago. And yeah, what do we, what do, we do with it? Uh, so yeah, there is a big mismatch. Yeah? So why can't we empower um, our students to make better use of computers? And the point that I want to make uh, in my presentation, and I think this is the point that you already all know, is it's actually not um, an issue of the, the software or the cost of the software or the quality of the software. And what I um, want to show um, are just a few examples how we use uh, free um, software in our lab. Um, okay, we only have enlightened teachers here, yeah? but one thing that I, I, I assume, right? Are we enlightened? <laughs> yes. yes. Of course. Yeah. Otherwise you wouldn't be here, right? Um, but but, but the, a case in point, yeah? Um, actually, sometimes uh, how we teach or how we, we talk about things uh, that, that determines the attitudes. Eh? So I have a car driving license. Eh? It's not a Toyota license or a Mitsubishi license. It's a car driving license. Eh? But students, they do not learn word processing or uh, presentations. They learn Word or PowerPoint. Eh? So if, if this is how we teach them or talk about things, we basically take away even the, the, the idea or the imagination that, that there could be something else. And if you think about 1984, yeah. Um, well, the, the government uh, designed the language basically to make it impossible to think um, neg negative or undesirable thoughts. This is pretty much the same thing. Yeah. So um, the one thing is that don't restrict the thinking of your students yeah, by, by uh, using dom uh, market dominating brand names. But the other thing is also don't restrict yourself from think, uh, about looking or thinking about uh, alternatives. Okay. Now. Most of you will be familiar. Huh? Um, yeah, the academic environment. This is actually where a lot of, of things come from. Why? Academic environment, uh, academia, at least used to be about uh, creating knowledge, understanding. Huh? So there is no requirement for commercial viability. Huh? It's not entirely true anymore. Huh? Uh, nowadays, there's a big pressure on commercializing things, especially in Singapore, I guess, but also worldwide. So it's a bit of eroding, but academia has a tradition of not just creating the things that are most valuable, but also sharing them. Yeah? So this was well, why um, it's such a, such a uh, good uh, treasure chest of, of, of innovation. Yeah? Sometimes um, research is publicly funded with the implication that the results also have to be made avail available to the public. Um, example is not exactly academic, but a lot of uh, US government work is in the public domain with a rightful argument. It's paid by the taxpayer, so it belongs to the taxpayer. Yeah? Um, this is one aspect where the United States are remarkable, uh, remarkably um, enlightened. Okay, but anyway, in this uh, environment, so, so uh, free software thrives, yeah? and it trickles down from these environments. That's why we have Linux nowadays. Yeah? Um, that's why we have a lot of, of high quality software. But of course, the drawback is um, there's no commercial marketing behind it, and academia has little interest in polishing something to make it, make it look glitzy. Yeah? 
Yeah. So, uh, which means um, the owners on finding a software is then not in some marketing agency, but it's it's on the on the user. Uh. So and this is maybe one of the reasons why we are not making, or the, why the open source or free software community is not making as much inroads in the, the education segment as we might want to. Uh. But okay, for for those unenlightened teachers here, there are no none, right? Um, basically just keep looking, there are solutions for almost everything. And quite often they're actually better. Okay, and this, I'm just going to show some random examples of software that, I, that we use in our lab. And actually some of it is very ancient software. And despite the fact that it's ancient, no one, the teachers, the students, do not, have, uh, do not seem to have heard of it. Yeah? Okay, who does not know GNUplot? Everyone knows, right? Okay, just for the benefit, uh, and let's see, now I have to find my shell. Here it is. Yeah. Okay, in our lab, students take data. They take data at school. They have all the school research projects. So let's see. And then they try to plot this in Excel and try some strange spline curve fitting or whatever and call this data analysis. Uh, uh, Okay, this is supposed to be a damped oscillation. Yeah. It's of course very noisy, yeah. but how do we extract the parameters? Has anyone ever tried to do serious curve fitting in Excel? It's almost impossible. Yeah. Or, well, you, you have to be a masochist to try it, right? Um, on the other hand, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm probably not telling you anything really. We, we can just define our model function. Amplitude times an exponential decay. I need my glasses for this. Times an oscillation with a frequency and a phase shift. Let's start with some random value. Oops. Comma. Okay, of course it doesn't match, eh? but um, it's trivial uh, to do a fitting GNU plot. There's the result. And by the way, this is not a high-end computer. It's a cheap netbook. It was the cheapest computer I could find about uh, three years ago. And it's a pretty decent fit. Huh? And I showed this to students, and their jaw drops. They were not aware that they can do this, and with such ancient software. Huh? So uh, I suspect most teachers also don't know this. Huh? And just, um, OK, it's great for data analysis. But it's great for documenting, but it's also a great mathematics teaching tool. Of course, there are educational um, plotting programs for functions for mathematical relations, yeah? but actually nothing is as quick and easy as this. Yeah? I mean, you can explore functions. We, we even have, have our coordinate system. You can put rulers in there. So, so uh, you, you can do measurements, everything. Yeah? So yeah, it's one of the very often used tools in our lab whenever we, we deal with data. OK, but you know all this, of course. And I have to get back to my talk. Oops, where are we? And well, why doesn't this work now? Okay, why doesn't my talk work now? Okay, don't tell me that LibreOffice now hangs. Ah, no, here, okay. Okay. So, Maxima. You all know Maxima? Yeah. I'm giving this talk. Okay, uh, who does not know Maxima? Okay. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> no, I keep it very short because I'm not very good at it. Yeah? Interesting thing is, Maxima dates back to the 1960s. Uh, but most students will not have heard it. So, um, symbolic method. Uh, mathematics, sy symbolic algebra system. Okay, and let's let's say your students um, learn calculus. Huh? Um, well, let's integrate a simple function. Is that correct? 
Okay, easy function to integrate, right? At least it should be. And it's tedious if you do it by hand. Oops, at the moment I show it, that does not work. So I think the function I wanted to integrate was actually one here. There we go. Can be done by hand. Uh, um, I'm pretty sure it's accurate. Uh. So uh, the point is, some things are within the um, reach of students to do by hand, but they're extremely tedious. Uh. With the right software, you empower them to approach te not difficult, but tedious problems. Uh, taking the, the, the grunt work away from them so they can focus actually on the content, on the interpretation of the result. What does it mean actually? Okay, um, let's do some, phys some physics. Yeah? Um, okay, location x is a function of time, right? Does anyone still remember what is velocity? It's a, diff it's a derivative of um, location with respect to time. What is acceleration? It's a derivative of um, velocity with respect to time. Oops, and why, does, oh, why doesn't this, sorry, this should not be an equal, this should be a dot. Yeah. So, oops. There we go. Okay. Now, we know, let's uh, say we, we do a harmonic oscillator. We, we all know Newton's law, right? Force equals mass times acceleration. And in the case of a harmonic oscillator, of a spring mass pendulum, what is the force? It's minus the spring constant times the location. There we go. And of course, it's a simple differential equation to solve, but it may not be a simple differential equation to solve for students. Uh, who, because typically, differential equations you learn maybe at A-levels, you learn at university. Um, but no problem. They, they can see actually how the solution arises. Uh, once they um, learn to trust Okay, and we need to make a distinction um, depending on the parameters. Um, well, we, we have to make sure our spring constant is positive because otherwise we won't get oscillation and our mass is positive. And that's our result. Oscillations are yeah, either, either sine component, cosine component with a frequency square root k over m. Yeah? That's what they learned from the physics textbook, but, but uh, they have a way now actually of verifying this themselves. Okay, I will not dwell too much on this because frankly I'm not very good at... Uh, Maxima for a reason. Recently, I switched to something else, which I hope I'm going to show you as well. Okay, Librocat, everyone knows? No? Who does not know? Okay, at least two or three. Okay, it's a simple, uh, it, it's not commercial quality, it's a simple 2D CAT drafting program, but um, frankly, it's good enough for, it, for most of what we do in the lab. Um, Let's see, where's my DXF? Uh, in the lab, we use a laser cutter to uh, manufacture most of our um, ex uh, experiments. We use LibreCAD to design it. Huh? So here's a design for, for an experiment um, for measuring the speed of light. Um, it's a, it's a multi-part laser cut thing. It's actually a uh, uh, it's an optical precision mount for, for mirrors, uh, laser diodes, photo detectors whatever, no problem designing all this, eh? and it's free. Eh? So you give students the possibility to design things, draft things, they get to apply the knowledge, they can actually build experiments. Eh? If they have um, access to, a, let's say, a, make, a maker space, laser cutter, whatever, eh? Three, or, yeah, or, or, or a CNC machine, they can design things. But um, it's not just about really designing things. It's, I find it also it's a great uh, math learning tool. Um, Let's create something. No? For example, um, how do we how do we uh, create 
how do you construct a tangent to a circle? Um, a tangent starting from a point. So, has everyone ever thought about this? It's, it's, it's a classic um, construction problem. Yeah? So um, how, how we would do this with, with a pencil and a compass? We, let's see. We take a connection from our um, point to the, uh, to the circle. We um, construct another circle around it. And our tangent is here. So it's actually a very nice way to to do um, constructive geometry, what typically you do with uh, pencil, uh, pencil uh, ruler, a straight edge compass, yeah? except now we do it with high precision on the computer. Once you do it with high precision on the computer, you can, much more com you can do much more complicated um, constructions, and you start to actually realize how, how, how these uh, methods work. OK. Well, I'm going to run already behind time. So let me show some other things. Um, electronic circuits. Um, you're all familiar with uh, GNU EDA? GNU uh, Electronic Design Automation? Yeah, everyone's nodding here, no? Let me show a very quick one here. What we can do, we can... Uh, okay. We can draw our own circuit diagrams. Yeah? And this is uh, the complexity of this circuit level diagram is typically what, what kids at least in my day built in primary school, the problem was they do not necessarily understand how it works. But that's not a problem um, because, uh, okay, it's actually quite difficult to understand how, how this circuit works because as the moment we have uh, semiconductors involved, the equations become very nonlinear, but we can simulate them. So we have simulation software. Huh? Okay, let's do a transient simulation of this circuit. And here is our output. And we see this circuit will generate an oscillation. It will turn something on and off. So this is the voltage at the, at the collector of our circuit. So we will turn an LED on and off. This is the controlling base voltage. Uh, basically, all the equations governing the circuit are solved, although they're nonlinear equations. And this pretty much describes what our circuit will do. So students can explore this without having to go through the detailed math. Uh, and elec actually, electronics is a topic that's coming back in Singapore and in the, in the curriculum now. Of course, if you really want to, you can also then the, you can also do your own circuit board. Here are our components. Let's just uh, quickly okay. There is a circuit board. All the trace is routed. Huh? You can print it out, etch it if you want, or send it to a, to a fab service. Done. Huh? So it's enabling technology for kids actually to, again to take their theory they they learn in from the textbook to actually do something useful that actually works. Huh? And again, we also use this uh, ourselves to uh, design our experiments. Okay. Now, the ultimate thing, of course, is programming. Mm? And this is a skill that I think every student should have. And fortunately, it's become uh, easier than ever, especially my absolute favorite these days is Python. Uh, I think it's, it's pretty much a favorite of every one. Often, a few lines of code will do the trick. And another favorite of mine um, is actually Jupyter, which I only figured out a few weeks ago. It's, uh, it's a replacement for IPython. It's kind of a mathematical like a front end um, that can run Python code and let's see, and it runs it on a web browser. And the nice thing is you can intermix code and commands. Um, you can use the mathematical uh, notation for the commands. You can write formulas, whatever. Yeah. And this is the reason why I use uh, Maxima less and less as actually a very nice uh, computer algebra system for Python called SimPy. So again, we can solve the same problem. We define mass, um, we define the spring constant, yeah. we define our velocity, we define our acceleration, there it is, Newton's law. Yeah. And all this is kind of a textbook-like format actually that students could easily go through and explore themselves and change things. Eh? Let's construct the equation of motion. There it is. And here I added actually a damping term, eh? so some viscous friction. Eh? 
Okay, and again, let's solve the differential equation. There it is. And let's do, let's calculate the result numerically and, and display what it will be. And indeed, we get a damped oscillation for the system. Yeah? So this is a spring mass system that has viscous friction in air. So you see, um, yeah, it, it co corresponds to the textbook theory, but it's actually, if you look at it, it's just a few lines of code. Yeah? It's an interactive session where students can actually use the computer to derive things in, in, in a systematic and self-documenting way. Um, now, the, can I overrun? Because I was promised 45 minutes originally. <laughs> okay. Um, the interesting, or one, one of the things where actually students uh, struggle in, in sciences uh, is the number of, of problems that can be solved using simple mathematics that can be solved analytically is actually very small. Most problems do not have analytical solutions. Uh, with the consequence, they never show up in textbooks. Um, and this breeds the, well, the perception that basically science or textbook science is not applicable to, to the real world. Uh, and uh, in this case, we can do a numerical simulation which is way too tedious to do by hand, but thanks to computers nowadays we can do it. Yeah? And the simplest example of, of something that's almost impossible to solve by hand is just a simple pendulum. I swing my arm here. Yeah? This is a nonlinear system. Um, you can try solving the differential equations. You will not get very happy. Yeah? But um, we can solve it numerically using numeric integration. And all the packages are available in, in Python, it's, it's part of the SciPy package. So here, here we define just in three lines the entire physics of the system. Uh, from then on, it's, we just specify the parameters, how long is our pendulum, what's the, the acceleration of Earth. And actually, I'm, I'm simulating our two pendulums simultaneously so that you see um, how this may differ from, uh, from the simple harmonic oscillator that students learn in school. Let's plot the result. Hopefully it works. Okay. And we get a result uh, that is not what students learn. Actually, the frequency of a pendulum depends on its amplitude. You have a larger amplitude, it goes slower. Uh, and actually, immediate application, um, if you have a grandfather clock, uh, if you wind it up, if you wind the, the, the spring up, uh, it tends to oscillate with a larger amplitude. Actually, then it goes a bit slower. As, as it runs down, actually, it speeds up a bit. Uh, so, but not typically discussed in the textbook because it's too complicated. Eh? Um, of course, another thing that you will not get with the approximations that we do in the, in the textbook, what happens if you give your pendulum a really big kick? Your, peri uh, your motion is no longer periodic. Eh? It's clear, eh? eventually you start rotating around. Eh? So you increase the angle, you go round and round and round, you never oscillate back. Eh? Again, you'll never get this from the simplified equations you find in the physics textbook. Eh? Simulating is numerically is trivial. Trivial if you have the, the computational power, and we have it nowadays. Amen. Okay, now this is uh, not entirely, you could argue it's not entirely programming. So, um, let me show um, two examples about real programming. And this was done by a student, two week uh, attachment. Um, program, uh, that student programmed a complete ray tracing uh, packet, well, almost complete ray tracing package for optics from scratch in Python. It's not the fastest, but it's based purely on the science in uh, school textbooks. Law of refraction and analytical geometry. Huh? You, you, you calculate the intersection of an optical ray with a surface, for example, and then you apply Snell's law to find the refraction. Huh? This wa was a two-week internship project. Um, we had a four-week internship project following this one to design an optical spectrometer um, that made use of this code. And within the four weeks, basically from zero knowledge, we were able to just take the glass and component specifications from optical uh, manufacturers, do a complete simulations, um, design our spectroscope accordingly. And uh, it ran on the first try with a um, expected or, or predicted performance. And let me just show you what this looks like. Um, okay, this here is this is uh, just a demonstration of their ray tracing. Um, for example, students learn in school that an optical lens focuses um, parallel light into, into a point. So here's our lens. You see the intersections with the lens. This is a focus point. This is a magnified section. You see, it's actually not true. 
there are aberrations. Yeah? A play lens does not focus light in one point. Yeah? That's why if you buy a, a camera lens, it has so many, it's made from so many individual lenses to correct that. Or our image is not uh, created or projected in the plane. It's actually on a curved field, this curvature of field. Yeah? Again, all this is done by secondary school students. Right? Chromatic aberration. We know you can get uh, color fringes. Huh? If you have a cheap lens, there you, you see purple fringing, green fringing. Yeah? Um, again, here on the magnified version, you see that the red focal point, the green focal point, the blue focal point are in completely different places. How do we correct that? This is something where well, it gets into advanced optical design. If we build an achromatic pair, we add a second lens and make the second lens partially correct the flaws of the first lens. So two lenses here, and look at the focal point. We still have um, up other aberrations, but just look at the focal distance here. It's now basically the same. So we corrected the chromatic aberration. Yeah. So and this is actually, well, not with this low software, but uh, this is the method how actually industrially or in, in real world um, optical um, designs are, are done. Yeah. So actually, and this is all school textbook knowledge just augmented with the power of the computer. So it's perfectly within the reach of secondary school students. Okay, the last thing that will be shown in simulation is actually a simulation of the spectrometer itself. We're going to show, that should come now in a few seconds. There it is. We have an entrance aperture, so all the light passes through one point, goes to a collimating lens, goes to a prism, goes to a projector lens, and we get a spectrum projected here. And uh, of course, it's not just the prism that uh, has chromatic aberration and, and splits the light or deflects the light depending on its wavelength. The lenses also have chromatic aberration. The result is actually that they, the focal plane or uh, the, the surface on which we get the light focus is actually very tilted with, with respect to the optical axis, which is again something that you will not find in the textbook. But it's essential actually to design a spectrometer that actually works. Yeah? And uh, so we use this simulation actually to find out where do we put our photo detector that registers the spectrum. Yeah. Okay, and I'm already waiting on time, so let me just show you the resultant spectrometer. I, I noticed someone else here at the conference uh, was actually showing a spectrophotometer, so it's a quite similar principle. Okay, where are we? Where are we? Okay, and again, this was a, about a 16 or I think 16 or 17 year old student. Yeah. Okay, it's fairly dark. Let's see. Uh oh, what happened now? I think now, what? now the connector moved. Let's reconnect. Okay, here you see um, actually the spectrum of our room light. Huh? Um, let me make it a bit slower, let's average a bit. And can actually start to, I to aim it. can identify the spectrum lines. There's a small tip here, this is uh, mercury, mercury, there's mercury in here. Um, this one is europium. Right, I have to give it a bit more light here, a bit more exposure time. The thing is, um, this, in, in terms of parts, uh, the spectroscope, Cost maybe hundred twenty dollars or so. Huh? The resolution is basically what you get for a few hundred to a thousand dollars from commercial providers, and it was designed and built by yeah sixteen seventy year old student within four weeks, with no prior experience. Huh? So these are things that are possible, and all this done completely using free software. Okay, now we may over time, and again I'm not telling anyone anything new. Although I may, because I was uh, during the keynotes, uh, during the opening of the conference, and I was a bit shocked how people started talking, oh, we're all open source, open source, and the implication, you're so free. Huh? And actually, um, open source has nothing to do with free. Huh? And the best example is a patent. A patent is, by definition, open source. It's, by definition, not free. Right? or you have a movie on a DVD, it's open source, you're entirely free to see the content. Does not mean you can use the content any way you like, right? So <clears throat> open source is not free, and free of charge is not free as in freedom. And actually, uh, yeah, free of charge is an obvious short-term incentive, but um, it can be dangerous. And then 
It's actually a marketing strategy um, extensively pursued by, by commercial companies in the educational sector. They get you in with free or, or very low cost educational licenses. Uh, they make sure you get used to the product, generate a lot of data files, whatever, get locked into the product, and then you graduate. Or you want to take up your product commercial, uh, and all of a sudden, yeah, students find, oh, I may have to fork out a few thousand dollars for MATLAB, for example. Uh, um, so um, this, for, for this reason alone, I, I would make an argument. It's actually ethically very difficult decision to, to uh, well, train students with educational uh, licensed commercial software in school. Yeah? The school, as a principal, as a teacher, you can make that decision, yeah? but it's not a decision that your students may be aware of or that they can fully um, yeah, appreciate in terms of the consequences. So I would strongly argue for using free uh, software so their students can take actually something along with them and can keep using it once they graduate. Okay, and that's pretty much it. Yeah? I'm over time. Sorry for that. Yeah? But my entire point um, computers are extremely powerful tools. Yeah? So if they're so powerful tools, we should empower the students to make use of them. Yeah? They're not just uh, consumer appliances, yeah? they're really tools, so the students need to learn tool skills. Yeah? Okay, um, there's lots of excellent uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics software out there. Yeah? It just lacks the polish. Yeah? So and the marketing, so we may have to look around, may have to invest a bit more into, into learning, into the learning curve, but in general, I think it's worth uh, it. Um, and it makes it practical then actually to take the learning of the students to next level, not just about computers, huh, but about mathematics, physics, chemistry, whatever, huh, because uh, the power of the uh, computer allows them to take the textbook concepts and apply them to real world problems that are otherwise too complex to handle. Yeah? Notice for teachers, students can do amazing things. The main problem, I, or one of the main problems I find in our lab, we try to offer advanced science classes to the kids. Yeah? We make them measure, measure the charge of the electron, the speed of light. Yeah? And the reaction from the teacher is, oh, this is too complicated for our children. We cannot do this. Teachers, yeah? if you are here, students can do. Let them do it. Yeah? Don't deprive them of this opportunity. Okay. Free of charge, free to you, or freedom, yeah? and open source are three separate things. Yeah? And keep in mind the ethical uh, issues, basically if you get uh, kids hooked on proprietary commercial software in school. And that's pretty much it. Thanks for your patience. Yeah? Have you missed the, you. the fire tornado already? I, I, I don't know. It's 3.30, right? Is it 3.30? What's it 3? Not quite sure. Okay, thanks for staying so long anyway. Um, So they take academics, PhDs, whatever in, people with, with research experience. And there, this may thrive a bit, yeah, but by and large, um, the, the state schools, government schools, by and large, uh, very homogeneous, Microsoft dominated. Teachers actually, sorry, well, well, are any Singapore teachers here? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, teachers are notoriously overworked or whatever, huh? but let's put it this way. Huh? Um, a lot of, of teachers in secondary school yeah, are engineering graduates, science graduates, whatever. Yeah? But actually, some of them seem to lack very basic skills. Yeah? So they don't really know. Yeah? So, so they, they never program the computer, yeah? or they never build anything. Yeah? Um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure how or why, but this is the way, the way things are. Uh, and it's actually, yeah, it, it's a lot of, of uh, uphill, it's an uphill battle basically to, to, to change this mindset. Uh. Um, a few years ago, actually, the uh, Ministry of Education in Singapore started an initiative called ALP, Applied Learning Program, um, to force secondary schools um, to teach the kids some hand-on skills. And um, I, I, 
I was involved in a meeting with one of these schools. Huh? The principal introduced us, yes, this is um, a so-and-so teacher, um, got a degree in mathematics, yeah, degree in physics, degree in chemistry, degree in uh, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. Yeah, this is our committee. We have no idea what to do. Tell us what to do. Yeah? And I'm like, why? You, know, you have the experts there. Yeah? Just use what you are supposed to have learned at university. Yeah? Yeah. But this is the reality. Yeah? I, you're from Australia, I guess? Or? I am from Australia, but yeah. it's not really Indonesia. Uh, okay. How, how do things compare? <laughs> with, with Australia or Indonesia? Very well, maybe different. both. <laughs> uh, Australia is probably a similar situation to Indonesia. Uh, sorry, to Singapore, there's yeah. a lot of uh, Microsoft dominated solutions. There does seem to be a pushback that's come through mm. lately where there's more of an appreciation of getting back to fundamentals and getting away from brands. Mm. Um, there's a lot of very brand dominated environment, and that has. There's been some appreciation that has caused problems. You, know, you have people come out very skilled, but only skilled in one uh, approach. So not forward minded. Um, and yeah, in Indonesia, a, a better way of explaining it is they've actually killed the ICT program in high schools uh, completely. So I think that's you know uh, there is none for anyone who's dominated or otherwise. It doesn't exist. So. Um, I mean, let, let me comment on, on, on the, the, the ICT program. You know, it's all something that, that astounds me. There are ICT programs, but they somehow all boils down to yeah, learn how to make a web page or whatever. Yeah? Yeah. And when I think back, I mean, you, you, you saw my, my memoirs here. Yeah? Uh, when I was in fifth or sixth grade, no one talked about ICT. Huh? But we learned about algorithms as um, part of the standard mathematics curriculum. Yeah. So I wonder where has all this gone? Yeah, um, another question now. Uh, let's let's wrap up the yeah. track <laughs> and then you can <laughs> Okay, thanks all for coming today uh, for, for the track. Uh, let's give another round of applause.